And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show comes to you. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. In 1953, Ensley decided to do something relatively new, a primetime television show on fishing. The weekly half-hour program called The Sportsman Friend included segments of fishing, hunting, and outdoor activities. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1991. For sports anglers, it's a dream come true. Spanning the globe, showing people, and telling them about the best fishing in the world. Jobs like this do exist. Just ask the crew of Kazan River Productions of the United Kingdom. Over the past few years, the Go Fishing program has stopped in Africa, Asia, numerous locations in Europe, and finally this year in northwestern British Columbia. Well, I think it's because the game fishing here is so exciting in these fast rivers. Uh, and the size of the steelhead average very well indeed compared to a lot of the trout that we catch back home in river systems. We've got very large trout put into stock waters but not in river systems. And the steelhead, 10 to 20 pounds, uh, is, is a wonderful prize. The Copper River was the location as the hunt for the now precious steelhead took place. It is the hunt, in effect, that is the main story behind go fishing wherefores and whys of sports angling and the attraction to all types of viewers is the main idea of the show. Well, what we, although the fishing is the program is a fishing program, what we try to do is make it wider because we don't want to appeal just to the anglers, although the program's for them. We want to make the program uh, fairly widespread so that it's enjoyed by lots of other people. So therefore we try and do things that are, are interesting to other people, like there's always different places you can see when you go fishing. Uh, there's different animals and there's different um, experiences, you know, so we try and wrap those into nice sequences and put those into the programme and John goes along and sees whatever is going on. So it becomes a much wider programme than just a fishing format. Does steelhead fishing in northwestern BC give you that? Are you getting what you're after? Oh, for sure, yeah, because, I mean, just the environment is so different. You know, I mean, there's not many people in England will have been up here in this river system, so they're going to be interested in that. In the past two years now, we, 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 we've done, or will have done when we finish this series, 18 programmes. Um, the programme we're doing in BC is, is one of six programmes, and last year we did 12. We went to places like uh, Africa, India, uh, Ireland, um, and some, we had some wonderful experiences in India catching the, the legendary Mars here in the very fast mountain rivers. Uh, and I was saying to Paul only yesterday that uh, the uh, the scenery here in British Columbia probably tops much of that we saw in India. It's really fantastic with these fast rivers and, and mountains, snow-covered mountains. It really is magical. A lot more than fishing, then. Uh, well, of course it is. In, in fact, going back several years now, one of the, the leader titles that we didn't use for the programme was It's Not Just Fishing, but we decided in the end to call it Go Fishing, which gives it perhaps a, a broader outlook. So the key to successful fishing, or for that matter, anything at all, is knowing what you're doing. Obviously, jaunting around the globe makes that extremely difficult for the crew of Kazan River Productions. In the Northwest, the crew called upon the expertise of area fishing guru Jim Kalp of River's Edge Fishing Guides. Local experts have proven to make a difference between success and failure in the programs. Oh yeah, it's the, probably the essence of the program is to work it out as much as you can before. You, can't, you can never say when it's going to go right, but what you can try and do is work out where it might not be so good. So you, by process of elimination, you get, try and get the people around that know about it, and then you work through the possibilities that are perhaps not going to be so good, and, and then try and get to the places that are. It's, the research is everything in it, really. Mm. How much time do you spend researching? Oh, all the time. Um, we, we work on quite a small time scale because we, for each programme, we get a maximum of about, I suppose, five days. So let's say from England, you have two days travel there and home. So you've got those few days left to do the shooting in, you know. Um, that's, the, that's the tough part, really. You don't know what's going to happen. It's hard in a way, because if you appeal just to the fishermen, let's say, they want to know very specific things about <clears throat> a point of casting or a point of fishing. Well, if we 
just did that, it would make it slightly too technical for everybody else. So what we try and do is, is give enough information about everything, almost to keep everybody happy. But the thing about coming here is to make it exciting. Well, with the short time we've got, we know we're probably not going to get a huge fish. But if we can make a good fish seem exciting and make it uh, interesting, you know, then really that's what we're aiming to do. In the Copper River, the target was a prize steelhead. The steelhead was an inviting catch, one of many memories for Kazan Productions in their history. Some of those fishing exploits put a little more teeth into the battle than others. And what we didn't want to do was to show the viewer, because, you know, we've got a very broad-based audience, including old people and children and non-anglers. Uh, and we didn't want to show the blood and guts system of a, of a shark coming over the the boat being gaffed and so we decided beforehand to take some wire cutters along and actually clip the hook off or unhook the shark in the water and trying to do that with 300 pounds of thrashing lemon sharks not easy in fact it's downright dangerous but one of the problems we face is if you do that uh, to pacify the people who don't like to see what happens on fishing you then stand a chance of losing your right hand so you can't win you're gonna have somebody moan at you uh, along the line whatever you do so the Brits are like almost every fish aficionado around the world, right? Well, not exactly. As John Wilson points out, the British angler has a much different mindset than their North American counterparts. Perhaps not so much because they want to, rather because they have to. We're a very small island in the UK. We've got uh, 60 million people, 3 million fishermen. There's too many of us on a little, tiny little piece of land with a very few river systems and lakes like you've got and so we can't afford to eat the fish and go and catch another one and eat it and eat it and, on, and so on because within five years there wouldn't be any fish left. And so the, the catch and release thing that, that's been instigated uh, in, in Canada in the last 10 years has been uh, operating in Britain now for quite a number of years. In fact, we often catch, and this probably sounds funny to you, we often catch the same recognisable fish, sometimes <laughs> twice in a day and we put it back and then somebody else catches it a week later and they put it back and then some, and it goes on and on and on. And if it wasn't like that, uh, we couldn't continue fishing as a sport. So in short, uh, unless it's trout or salmon in Britain, everybody returns the fish they catch. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Museums play a critical role in preserving local culture. With careful documentation and artifact preservation, a culture can be recorded and remembered regardless of its future. Let us return to the archives with Houston resident Marina Gaffey. The Maurice Bulkley Heritage Museum under construction in Houston is a dream turned into reality for a few longtime residents. Project coordinator Myrna Gaffing says the museum will not only outline the early history of the area from Topley to Hazelton, but will provide a major tourist attraction for Houston. Yes. The museum is, is on eight acres of land. It will take about two hours for people to uh, fully see the site and certainly when the displays are, are here and there'll be a lot of history to, to go into and it's on the early development of the valley, the, the spin-off for tourism is going to be just super, uh, especially for the town of Houston. The museum is still under construction, but we can get a feeling for what will be from this model. You come in on site to a parking lot here and this is the information building. There'll be pamphlets and things in that for, for visitors. This is the old schoolhouse. Of course, this is the old outhouse here and, and here <laughs> for bathroom facilities on site. This is the farm machinery building here and the picket house. The reconstructed sawmill, uh, the building, these two buildings are under construction right now. Uh, this is for the thrashing machines, the two thrashing machines that are too big, too tall for the farm machinery building. And the tugboat building, and that tugboat is still on site at Morris uh, McBride Lake. And this is the building for this one here is to house the um, uh, fire truck. These are the two reconstructed uh, pioneer homes, and that is on uh, called Harold Thornton um, Memorial Street. Mm -hmm. This uh, whole area up here is the coal mine display, and that is called Gething Lane, as a matter of fact. 
Gething Lane gets its name from Lloyd Gething, who is well known to residents of Telqua as the longtime operator of the old Telqua coal mine. Well, we're surrounded by things that used to be part of the Bulkley Valley Collieries coal mine, the early coal mine in Telqua. Not the first coal mine, but the one that was the largest and the one that was the longest operating and the one that was mechanized. And we have all these machines gathered together and likely the best coal mine display in Western Canada. I guess the interesting part here too is you've probably touched each one of these machines individually in their working life as well. Yes, that is correct. Because I was in, involved for better than 30 years uh, with the coal mine under its two different owners as their manager and of course was personally involved in the operation and uh, the maintenance of all of these machines. Gething is an authority on coal mining and one of the charter members of the Museum Society. He sees the past captured here as well as an opportunity for the future. The future of the museum, of course, will carry on the dreams of other people. We, we have put together our early concept here and with the changing directors and the changing people, it will change and move. And that, that, is, that is always the way anything should go. You get no growth if you keep the same people. So the next people who come along will, will advance and change the concept. But what we're doing here is laying the foundation. This museum project is being built on the backs of volunteers like the Gathings, who moved from their home in Hudson Hope to Houston to work on the museum project. But more help is always needed. If you'd like to get involved, call Lloyd or Myrna Gething in Houston or drop up to the museum site at the Four Seasons Park. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. An economic leakage study qualifies the level and type of spending that occurs outside geographic boundaries of a specific community by its residents. Leakage refers to the money that leaks out of a local economy through expenditures on goods and services. Let us return to the archive to see how Kitimat is dealing with leakage. The concept is simple. Consumers can obtain interest-free loans, minimum $500, maximum $2,000, from Kitimat's Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, and the money can then be spent at the 58 Kitimat merchants and businesses taking part in the smart money promotion. What's the catch? Yeah, yeah like we get the same reaction with people coming in, but, but how come you're doing this? I mean, there must be a catch to this. No, there isn't. It's really, it's, it is quite simple. From the consumer's point of view, uh, for this program to work and to be a benefit, it really does have to provide them with a benefit, and it does. They get their money interest-free. The uh, bank is being compensated. Uh, it's uh, in a small way. Uh, but for the merchants, the, when the, the merchants pay a small fee to the bank for the purchases that are made with the smart money, uh, the fee is very comparable to the fee that they would pay to the bank if they were accepting uh, a credit card for a purchase. It works on the same basis as the credit card deal. So they pay a small discount to the bank, and that's what we receive instead of interest. So it's the merchant that's, that's covering that in a small way. The Chamber of Commerce's Retail Committee came up with the idea for a promotion to encourage shopping in Kitimat, copying an idea that has worked well in small towns in Saskatchewan, and a wide variety of businesses are taking part. That, I think, was what we were looking for and hoping for was a diverse group of uh, businesses that could come in and give the consumer a choice rather than just um, clothing or jewelry or stereos and uh, we can you can have your roof done 
you can have your driveway paved and you can get your uh, siding for a house or new carpets or so it, it, I think it's really working really well and the business community has got behind it they're very positive and we're hoping that uh, it will be a success this year and it will become an annual event. Yeah, that would be nice because then people can really plan from year to year. Exactly. And uh, they can say, okay, we're going to get a big ticket item and we will wait and get uh, the smart money loan and shop smart, shop Kitimat. And I know you're hoping to attract consumers from Terrace, and I know Terrace has already expressed real interest in running this for themselves. I believe they have. Um, we're hoping that we get uh, lots and lots of Terrace consumers into Kitimat to spend their dollar. And I know um, the chamber there has expressed an interest in it, and good luck to them. Though the CIBC won't quite cover its costs, it expects to benefit in the long term by introducing its services to new customers. And smart money enables shoppers to plan ahead. Oh, yeah. And that's exactly the, the idea of the program, is that uh, people are going to be able to apply for the, for the money now, um, make their purchase uh, at the time that it's needed. And at this time of the year, there's always lots happening with, with uh, expenditures. Uh, around the home and also of course with Christmas coming uh, we know that uh, it's it's a little bit hard on the budgets and here is an opportunity to uh, make some of those uh, expenditures and plan through the early part of next year to cover those expenses on a regular monthly basis as well as help with those Christmas lists consumers are looking at big ticket items We've seen uh, quite a few people interested in purchasing their winter tires. It's a purchase that's coming up very shortly for most people. Uh, we've also seen uh, some people applications for such things as improvements around the home. And those seem to be major appliances and, and major improvements at the home have been the bulk of our applications to this point. And the bank will assist out-of-town shoppers who want to take part in the smart money promotion by having staff available on Saturdays in Kitimat's city centre mall. Starting through November and December, on Saturdays, uh, have a desk set up in the mall, in the city centre mall, in the lower concourse, and we will accept applications and process them, uh, hopefully uh, within a matter of an hour or so, um, so that uh, out-of-town shoppers can come down, uh, bring us their application form, we'll process it, process it, and they can get out right out with their purchases right away. Shoppers will receive a special set of smart money checks to use at participating merchants. Okay, well, we treat them just like a regular check. Uh, they can spend up to $2,000 either in one place or spread it through the, throughout the community. Um, we do have something to keep track of all the checks in. We go numerically. When all 10 checks are gone, you can go back to the bank and apply for more. Some shoppers have already put away Christmas gifts but you don't have to start paying until the middle of January, yes. so you get eight months. Is this one of the best promotions you've seen in your, in your oh, association yes. in the retail side? Oh, gosh, yes. I, I really, it's so simple and easy to use. It's just like spending a check of your own. It really is excellent. Your money's in the bank gaining interest. Jeanette Zamata is one of the shoppers planning home improvements with her smart money. What's the advantage of this type of an insert over, let's say, a wood stove? Okay, it's a lot cleaner for the environment. It's safer than a wood stove. You don't have to worry about chimney fires. It's a lot easier. You don't have to go out for wood to put in your fireplace. All you have to do for the gas fireplaces is flick on a switch and you have your flame and your heat. And once shoppers understand the benefits, they're enthusiastic. What sold you on the Shop Smart program? Well, Lee, I've always been taught not to look a gift horse in the mouth. And I like the idea of leaving my money in the bank to continue collecting interest and being able to use money from the bank and then just pay it back over a six month period with no interest. I think it's a great idea. Uh, and if I wasn't you know, buying the insert, I would use it for Christmas shopping. 
You can apply for loans at the CIBC right up to December 30th, but the money has to be spent by December 31st at the participating stores. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Ski areas are a valuable component to the tourism industry. They provide one of the most important motivating factors for traveling to and around British Columbia during the winter months. In this final segment of Open Connection, we return to the archives to see two ski areas compete for downhill skiers. With two ski facilities a little under three hours apart, the competition level and potential for rivalry is obvious. While Shames Mountain and the more established Ski Smithers battle for downhill enthusiasts, the two ski areas have decided to join forces in an effort to draw even more people to the area. Well, we have a few programs that we have in place right now, and uh, we're quite excited about them. One is the uh, Learn to Ski program that's co-sponsored by Pepsi, and um, it's basically a feeder program for skiers to either mountain. So you can register for the Learn to Ski program at any sports shop in Smithers or Terrace and register for either mountain. The other program that we're working on is a Southeast Alaska program, and um, there are a lot of skiers in Southeast Alaska, and they're joining us by air and by road. So we're working together to get them to ski supernatural north by northwest British Columbia rather than going to the lower 48 states. What is the potential from Alaska? I mean, it, there's a great distance, probably air travel, there's probably ferry travel. What are the difficulties trying to arrange to get skiers from Alaska here? Well, mainly transportation. Um, if we can get them here, they certainly enjoy the enjoy the, the skiing that they experience here. Um, there is a ferry ride down and then a, a short drive over to Shames, a little bit longer drive over to Smithers. And that's where we're pursuing in Smithers the customs office aspect, whereby a 45-minute direct flight from Ketchikan will bring you right into Smithers. You can be at your hotel within an hour and a half. So once we get through the transportation challenges, we're able to actually bring quite a few people in um, from Alaska. Is this all in the formative stages? Have you actually approached uh, as to uh, hills trying to reach out to Alaska, or are you just thinking about it at this point? Basically, we have one joint marketing campaign that we're just implementing for the Christmas um, season. Um, further to that, as far as doing a joint trip with two mountains during one trip, we're going to have to work on that a little bit. Um, right now, we're just trying to get them to come to this area and introduce them to what we have, and later down the road, work towards some kind of a, a joint trip for them. Well, there's there's a few options available to us that uh, we can go after the Alaskan market in a joint mar market, uh, putting together uh, overnight packages with hotels uh, and uh, travel and maybe breakfast, so that both of us as a group are a little bit stronger than one, uh, one ski area going after the whole market. It's an interesting marriage of businesses who must go head-to-head -head for the always tough entertainment buck. But at the same time, it's progressive thinking that will likely pay dividends for all. We're very lucky, and we're very lucky in this whole um, portion of the region to have two ski areas that can provide as much entertainment as we have. It's a long winter up here sometimes, and when you have the opportunity to ski and different choices, it makes it all that much better. And better it is, not only for Ski Smithers, but Shames Mountain as well, as the new facility heads into year two of its operation. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pickjob. <laughs>